I'm privileged to introduce Barry Sinclair to you. He is the founder and president of Reach Out Youth Solutions. He's had a ministry to young individuals, young people for over 30 years. He's written over 25 books. This is a man who understands adolescent ministry. And today, in this hour, he'll be spending time thinking about Jesus-focused ministry. At the breakout session this afternoon, he'll spend time thinking with us about Jesus-focused youth ministry. Thanks for being here, Barry. Don, thank you. Barry. Thank you, Foley. Thanks to all of you for your beautiful stories. I love it. Mark this quote down. We don't have time to disciple our kids. Would you do it? Men's Bible study to, to disciple high school kids. Just, just tuck that, just wrap that around as a picture in your mind because that's where we're going to go here in just a minute. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the things that you all said. I'm honored to be here about that J January 22nd thing. We can talk some more about that afterwards I'll be outside, but I think there's some cards somewhere that Greg had that he was going to make sure you all had to let you know, you, so that you could let us know if you're interested in doing that. So whoever wants to do that can do so. Say this after me as a prayer. Just close your eyes. If you want to lift your hands up, just do that. And just say this prayer after me. Oh Lord, you are my God. I exalt you. I praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness, you have done marvelous deeds, things planned long ago. Amen. That's what God is doing has done, is doing, and wants to do in the Anglican church in the days that are ahead. When you think about where the Anglican church, 10 years from now, when you have this meeting and we're all coming here <clears throat> to the same place again, think about who would be here. Who will be here? Most of us will not be here. We'll either be in heaven or in a wheelchair somewhere. But the people that will be here will be here because somebody planted a church or because somebody said, I have a vision and a burden for the younger generation. And we at our church are going to invest in the younger generation. And the result of what happens with the Anglican church is tied up in those two concepts, in my humble opinion. I'm honored to be here and speak for that reason. I'm honored to be here today and share with you for just a few minutes. And I'm very thankful for you and what you do, for my friend Foley, for all the leadership here, and all of the potential that's represented in this room right here, right now. I mean, it's heavy. It's heavy with that kind of potential. And so what I want to address for just a few minutes, I wish I had all day like on the 22nd, we'll take our few minutes here and just simply say, how do you personally, you personally, as the rector, pastor, bishop, whatever your job is, lay person of the church, how do you personally, and then how does your church raise up young warriors for Jesus Christ? That's what we want to talk about for a few minutes. And the way we want to think about that then is to say then, how do you personally and how does your church maximize your influence in order to be able to do that? Because it's only when we intentionally maximize our influence that these things actually happen. The young people in your church now those little kids that will soon be teenagers, all of those, those younger generation people are, from my point of view, the most precious asset you have. After the gospel, after the Book of Common Prayer, that's 
right there. And if we recognize that and grab hold of it, then everything will be different in the Anglican Church. Okay, I have five children myself. All five of those kids are married, equals 10. There are 12 grandchildren. At one time, with those grandchildren, they were 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. <laughs> and the, the one who is third from the, from the bottom, number 10, his name is Scotty. Scotty was four when his dad took him to the first, his first Ash Wednesday service. And at the Ash Wednesday service, he went up to the front. I guess he was with his dad or whatever, but he went up to the front. He got the cross put on his head. So they put the ashes here. And he was so enthused about that that he could not stop looking at himself in the mirror. He could not stop, he could not stop talking about it. And from that time until after dinner, he was so fired up about this cross that was on his head. After dinner, he took a bath, and the cross washed off. And he was so distressed when he realized that, that he started crying, squealing, screaming about the fact that he had lost the cross off his head. He went to bed crying. The next morning, his father, my son, who is a pastor out in Berkeley, California, he, he is sleeping there. Maybe you've had this happen with your kids somewhere along the way. And he's sound asleep, and he feels this breath on his face. <laughs> he opens his eyes and sees that little face about that far from him. And what he sees is a, that same kid with a big smile, a cross etched across his forehead in permanent magic marker. <laughs> There he is. Now, now, what my vision is for the Anglican Church and younger, the younger generation is that every kid, whether they're 4, 14, even 24, all within that younger generation, that every one of them that comes under the care of your church or is in your community would have the opportunity to have the cross of Jesus Christ etched on their forehead permanently for the glory of God. Amen? Amen? So how do we do that? That's a great thing in concept and vision, but how does that actually happen? What does this look like? What does this look like, and why in the world would we choose to do that? We can choose to do that because it's in those years, children, middle school, high school, it's in those years that kids are transformed. They're transformed from immature and superficial to mature and solid followers of Jesus. It is in that time that kids who have a fuzzy sense of identity, lots of issues and problems in their lives, a lack of a sense of destiny, begin to find who they are in Jesus Christ and what their destiny is to become warriors, followers of Jesus for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God. That's where about 80% of all of that transformation that goes on in the church happens that time in those years. So it makes sense. Why would we choose to invest in the younger generation? For that simple reason. And then the question comes, so what does that actually look like? I mean, when we're going to talk about doing it, what, is it, what does it look like? Well, here's how it begins in my, from my point of view, and I think this is a biblical point of view, so you can see if you agree with me or not. But what it begins with in our culture in America is that it begins with a radical return to Jesus and his way of doing life and ministry. Amen. Say that one more time. To return to a, ra a radical return to Jesus and his way 
of doing life and ministry. And I say that because having done this for 40 plus years, all the way back there, my friend, um, all the way back to the, to the 70s, I've seen about everything there is to see in youth ministry and about every kind of church. And I can tell you that about, I'm guessing here, this is not objective, but I would say probably 90 to 95% of all the churches that we encounter have lost sight of what that radical return to Jesus is. And they're doing things that are like, like superficial, mile wide, inch deep kinds of, kinds of things that are, not, that are causing kids by all the statistics that are coming out now to are leaving the church because we're not doing the essential things that have to be done in order for kids to experience that transformation that we were talking about. Frog in the kettle. Most people, when we talk about Jesus-focused youth ministry, most youth leaders say, oh, we're doing that. Check, check that off. But when you get to looking at what the church is actually doing and how that stacks up with the New Testament measuring stick, then the results do not come out the same. And so we need, an, we need a radical return to Jesus because youth ministry in America is not normal New Testament. It is abnormal, subnormal not where it needs to be. And so then we continue by saying, okay, if we begin there with that radical return, then what do we do to continue on? We refocus on Jesus and we look and say, we're gonna, we're gonna develop a solid foundation in our church for this. There is no other foundation that can ever be laid other than the one that's already been laid, which is, help me out here, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3. For the love of God compels us, for we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And the one who died for all died so that we might live, so that we might die and be raised up with him. Therefore, if any person is, is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. Basically, the whole idea here is to refocus on the gospel of Jesus, what he came to do, what he wants to do in our churches, what he wants to do in kids' lives, and then working that out in a very practical way so that it's expressed with beauty and in kids' lives. So, when we come along the next step, we begin with a radical return, we refocus on Jesus, and then what do we do when we say, well, we're going to apply this in our situation? At that point, we say, I need to see myself and we need to see ourselves as fulfilling the ADOT mission statement. So let's just bring that into a place here where everybody here knows these words. The Anglican Diocese of the South exists to equip clergy and congregations to fulfill the great commandment and the great commission by leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ through personal discipleship, evangelism, nurturing, and planting of churches. Do I hear an amen to the mission statement? Amen. Okay, that's, that's good stuff there. And so what I'm here to do is to say to you and to encourage you and to challenge you with the younger generation in your church to bring that mission statement alive right there where you are. So how do we do that? Well, if you'll humor me here a moment, if everybody will just put one arm up here and one arm out here, that'll, that'll be good. If you feel like you want to poke somebody in the ribs, help yourself, I don't care. Relaxed here. Arm up, arm out. If you don't remember anything else I've said today, I want you to remember this. This is the essence of it all. It summarizes the whole New Testament, the whole of the gospel message right here. The great commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength because he's loved us with all of who he is. Love God. And the second is likened to it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yes? Amen. Hey, don't drop those hands. <laughs> it's not even noon yet. 
So the Great Commission says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go and make disciples of all nations. And what happens in this illustration when we bring that down to our personal lives? It's that God wants me to connect. You can put your hands down now because you'll see this illustration two or three more times here. But, but what God's desire is, is that we would connect to his desire to connect with us. And that we would open our hearts up to let him in and let him do his transforming work inside of us. And when he does this, then the result of this is that we have then the capacity to invest in, to influence, to make a difference in the lives of people, whoever they are, but young people in this case, to make a difference in those people's lives. So if you ha don't remember anything else here today, just remember that little illustration up there. And remember that it's a relational bridge. See, this is, this is a relationship, not a program. This is a relationship, not a program. This is definitely a relationship with my heart, with God and me and me and these people. And so when you see all of the New Testament and even the Old Testament through that prism, through that perspective, you begin to realize the church is like the nomad people there from who are, are wandering around at Redeemer Church, that it's not about programs, it's about relationships. And obviously relationships have to be structured. But so, far, so long in this whole process of church life, we have so put things into programs that we've lost sight of this, or we tend to lose sight, let's say it that way, of this and this. So part of the whole youth ministry thing here and looking at young people and how we make a difference in their lives is to consider ourselves, you, your leaders in your church, a relational bridge to the younger generation, connecting them with God, and as we connect with them, them connecting with each other and their friends to bring about life transformation all around. The church is an army not an audience. And what we, what we need to be about in the church as a whole, as well as with young people, is to turn, turn the church from an audience into an army. People may come in as an audience, but they need to leave and go out as an army. So our challenge here today for us to, with this few minutes is to say, how do we begin to transform change, work on restructuring a paradigm shift that would cause us to be able to have that kind of army, young warrior type of mentality toward our young people so that everything we do is intentionally geared to raising them up to be young warriors, fruit-bearing warriors, followers of Jesus who are going to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Is that a good challenge to take? Well, with that in mind, let's, let's look at a couple of things here that I think are hopefully helpful to you in thinking about this. One is, if we're going to do this, then, then we do it by seeing ministry, particularly youth ministry. We see ministry the way Jesus saw it. So I just want to walk us through a little thing that, that we've learned over the years that's helpful to us, and maybe it'll be helpful to you. Let's look at Matthew 9. 35 through 38, very familiar passage to all of us. So let's just read it out loud. And um, as we read it out loud, just think through what it's actually saying there in a fresh new way. So Jesus went. Okay, let's go.
We're back to this again. You look at that passage and you look at Jesus and you say, where in the world did the man get the authority and the power to teach a message that nobody else had ever taught? Where did he, where did he find that message of good news? Where did he get the power to heal people around him? And where did he get the love and compassion to love people who were unlovable, harassed, and helpless like sheep without a shepherd? Where did that come from? Well, it came from his connection, obviously, with his father. The son does nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing, Jesus said. So here's Jesus with all this authority, love, power, healing, compassion, and what does he do? He has incredible capacity to be able to then influence the life of every person that he touches. Up and then out. But you got to go through. Jesus connected to his Father, connects with people. Apply that to us. Apply that to youth ministry. Apply that to wherever you are. So when we look at this passage, what does it say about us? It says about us that we too have the capacity to do all the things that Jesus did because he said, ask the Lord of the harvest and then he's going to send out laborers into the harvest field. And so what we have the capacity to do, going back to the inner healing thing, what we have the capacity to do because of the gospel of Jesus and because of his work in our lives is to have the same authority, the same ability to teach, the same capacity to heal, the same love for other people that allows us to, to be able to express that to other people in ways that impact their lives. And I think there are some ways that you can overplay that because I'm not Jesus. There are other ways that we diminish that and say, I'm not Jesus. But somewhere in there, there's a terrific release of God's energy and power that he wants to release in the church and particularly toward younger, the younger generation to reach that generation of whom only 10% ever the darken the door of a church. And so when we look at that from a little different perspective, we've, we've diagrammed it sort of like this. Yes, we have. Uh, so you look at that last part of that, Jesus gives us the strategy to bring about this transform, transformation we're talking about because he says, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. So he says to pray to pursue Jesus, equip others to multiply leaders, and then evangelize to reach people. And the way we've worked that out is that in our youth ministry strategy that Don and I are going to be doing with Jonathan Adams, is we say, well, ask the Lord of the harvest by going deeper with Christ and praying with passion. We equip leaders by building leaders and discipling students, adult leaders who disciple students. And then those people penetrate the culture and move out to do evangelism. Here it is described another way. I like it better in circles than boxes. Jesus, if I could have made him bigger, I would have. Uh, Jesus is the core, and everything we do comes, emanates out from him to go deeper, pray with passion, build leaders, disciple students, penetrate the culture, and create outreach for kids. When you look at your average youth ministry in the church, and I have no idea what yours is like, but if yours is average, then basically what happens is this whole picture up here is reversed out. So that what, is, what happens is we start out there, we've got to get kids into the seats. We've got to get them into the church. So anything we can do to entertain, to bring activities, to have anything that will bring them in, we do. So we expend incredible amounts of time, money, and energy on that. And then when it comes to discipling students, well, we, we, we will. So we'll have a little small group on Wednesday night for 15-minute little Bible verse 
And uh, who's going to lead that? Well, we don't have anybody to lead it, so we'll just, because nobody's trained to do that. And so if we do have some leaders, nobody's ever really nurtured them and discipled them, so they don't know how to disciple somebody else. And so as a result of that, nobody goes deeper, nobody prays with passion, and you end up with what you end up with, which is youth ministry in most churches in America. Reverse that, and I'm not trying to be critical here, I'm just trying to give you a contrast to what Jesus' picture of that is. Because in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, Jesus says it's not about outside in, it's about inside out. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, the same shall bring forth much fruit. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me will bring forth much fruit. So the key two words there are abide, stick to, Velcro, hang on to, however you want to define that in terms of being tight. That's what that's about. So our objective here is to say, how do we help kids be tight with Jesus on an ongoing way? Great soul in the city, but how do you do that all year? How do you help kids do that? And then if they're tight, then over time, if somebody is investing in them to help them be t get tight, be tight, stay tight, then the end result of that is going to be that fruit is going to be born from this passage. Fruit, more fruit, much more fruit. And the result of all that is going to be that we're going to have raised up young warriors who are followers of Jesus who are going to make a difference in your church and in the next generation. Wow. If we can do that, that's going to be really good. But what it takes in order to be able to do that is a paradigm shift. So what will it take for you to be able to make that shift? That's kind of the question. Because I would guess for most of us, let's say we're all average churches. You, nobody thinks that our church is the average church, but you know what I'm saying. In youth ministry, if we think of ourselves that way and have a realistic analysis of it and say, that's where we are then what do we do to make the paradigm shift? And I want to take just a few minutes to kind of work that out with us in the time that we've got. So, first of all, we see youth ministry through Jesus' eyes. And hopefully that's given you a picture of how to see it a little differently than how it's most of the time viewed. And the second thing in then is how do we do youth ministry like Jesus did? How do we do that? And as I, Don and I said before, we're going to flesh that out on January the 22nd here in Atlanta at one of the Trinity churches. We're not sure where yet, but we're, we're going to do that on that day for about six or eight hours, and we're inviting you to come. But for now, in a little hopefully encouraging way with more stories, that I can say to you, when you do this, when you do it like this, God does take care of his promise that he is going to bear fruit through you in regard to this. So, three stories. First one is my story. I grew up in a little town of West Virginia, coal mining town. I was so into basketball, it was all I could think about. Loved playing ball, was successful in doing that. Went to Davidson College on a scholarship, played basketball there for two and a half years. In between that time, after my freshman year at Davidson, I, um, I see Colin sitting back here, a Davidson grad, he can attest to this fact, okay. that he, he and I, I'll put you with me, buddy, he and I probably didn't measure up very well academically that first year. How'd you do in that? <laughs> well, <laughs> There were about 95% of us who were not in that category. <laughs> and I was one of them. And so I was struggling there. I was trying to play basketball, academically, athletic. I, I was not feeling like I was measuring up at all. First time I'd ever felt like a failure. That summer, as a result of that need, that brokenness experience, I had an encounter with Jesus. I grew up in the church, went there every time the doors were open, thanks to my mom and dad. 
it was here but not here. That summer I had this heart encounter with Jesus Christ where he moved from my head to my heart. And that was a life changer for me. And once that began to take place and God began to work in my life, my thought was, now that I've come to Jesus, John 10, 10 certainly is true. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So the silver spoon that had always been in my mouth before, I thought would now switch around from the poor academics and other things, difficulties I was having. And now Jesus in my life, we would just, we would just take off on this trajectory of success like this. God had set me up that year before with that failure that year at Davidson because the, res the, the, the resulting cascade of downward brokenness has been a part of my life ever since that time. From a year and a half later, in an obedience decision, giving up my scholarship to play basketball, from that point to being fired from my first youth ministry job, interesting story there, but when I left basketball and gave that up, Within two weeks, I was a part of a youth ministry experience that I'd never had before that brought me to this point in my life. After I got fired from this job, I started Reach Out Youth Solutions, which is now working in 40, 30 countries around the world. And so, brokenness experiences, and those were difficult experiences. But in 1998, when my wife Carol, to whom I'd been married for 28 years and had four children, died, that was an unraveling. That was a brokenness. Bill knows about that. An unraveling, a brokenness. And I would say that in my life, those other experiences were God, he, it was God working in me to bring about a brokenness in my life. And these experiences just shattered me and my family. The experience of Carol's death, being the single father of an 11-year-old and trying to take care of the other three, and then remarrying in a beautiful story that God brought about, remarrying and then trying to blend a family. And the combination of those things have been a combination of brokenness in my life. And up to that point, I mean, that was just an, a difficult, hard time. And since then, I've had more, of, more brokenness experiences. But the point is simply this, that God has called us to go deeper with him, just like we saw. And the way we get deeper with him is to lean into him. And when we go deeper with him and we lean into him and he puts and gives us these adverse, difficult, tragic, unraveling experiences of brokenness, then there's less of Barry and more of Jesus. And that's how he shines. So when we call the youth ministry to go deeper, that's a problem. Because most people don't want to do that, what I just did. And yet God calls us into an experience of brokenness with him. But that's the challenge of taking kids and our own selves deeper into him. And finding brokenness, experiencing it, and then God using it to heal us for his glory. Going deeper, this way, we press into Jesus. And then, as that's going on, we build leaders and we disciple kids. We go inside and then we go outside. You can't go outside till you're inside because <laughs> this is where we get the capacity. But then when we step into that, even if we know very little practically about what we're supposed to be doing, God uses it to make a difference. I spoke at, participated in a funeral two weeks ago of the wife of probably my best friend, one of my couple of three best friends. And Bill and Regina and Carol and I got to be friends in a little Sunday school class years and years ago before any of us had kids. And we got to be friends then. And we went on a retreat together. And on that retreat, God just did a dynamic work of changing their lives. Carol and I had already stepped into this. We had the opportunity to minister to them, and God began to do a work in their lives. Lordship in Bill's life, in her healing in Regina's life. As a result of all that, I started a discipleship group for, the, for some guys in that group. 
Carol started a discipleship group with Regina and some others. On the Regina side, that group grew in depth and influence. Regina came from a very broken family. Her brother, at this point, was rebellious, on drugs, dropped out of high school. We started praying for him in our leadership group where we were nurturing one another. We prayed for him and Bing met Jesus in a radical and dynamic way. Never touched drugs again, got back into school, now married, has three almost grown kids, married a girl who was a part of our ministry. Trophy of God's grace. Not only did that happen, but their mom was a raging alcoholic. And their dad had abandoned them. And in the process of our prayers and this little leader, youth ministry leadership team that we were a part of, discipleship group kind of thing, as a result of that, Bing came to, Regina was in her healing, Bill made lordship decisions, Bing got, got his life squared away, and her mom came to know Jesus and never touched alcohol again until the day she died. I did her funeral, it was beautiful, beautiful. The amazing capacity that God brings about when people are in a deci- an intentional, discipling, caring for, praying for one another relationship makes all the difference in the world in youth ministry. We're building leaders, and then what are we doing? We're going to disciple the kids. So this is where it comes to the youth ministry part. Bing was a part of that. He was a high school kid. He was a part of that, but he wasn't the only part of it. There was a whole group. Most of these people in this group were leading some kind of high school discipleship group or another. None of us knew anything about what we were doing. We were just doing it because God had led us to do it. So we started doing it, and God began to work. I led my first discipleship group out of that same community of people, church community of people. I started my first discipleship group. It was the first time I'd ever done this. I'd gotten the burden for it. I'd got Gene knows. I'd gotten a burden for it. I'd got a, got, gotten a, a, a vision for it. Knew nothing about what I was doing. So I had this discipleship group, and we had t- uh, ten, 10 guys, 8 or 10 guys out there. And I had a podium, kind of like this. And I had my notes, and I would stand up and speak to these guys every week for 10 weeks. And I'd ask them if there were any questions. And we'd have a little prayer, and they'd go. And when we finished the 10 weeks, I taught them about everything I know and more. And so we left, and we were done. A few weeks later, I find out that one of the guys had started going to a Jewish synagogue. Well, that wasn't exactly my discipleship outcome that I was looking for. (laughs) So I stepped back and said, okay, well, where did we go wrong? What do we do? And I was learning lots of things in here. And so I went to to Lee, and I sat down with him. I said, buddy, what's what's going on here? And and he, come to find out, he had been in this church, been in my discipleship group, and he'd never met Jesus. And I had the opportunity to lead Lee to Jesus Christ and to start a, that discipleship group all over again. Every one of those guys is walking with Jesus. Most of them today are in, in professional ministry or some kind of ministry. Lee Grady went on to be, and, I, and he and I, we still do ministry together. But he went on to be the editor of the largest college, Christian college newspaper in America, the editor of Charisma magazine. He now builds, speaks to, to uh, churches all over the world uh, about abuse of women. He's written about 10 books. And if you had seen him when he was a sophomore in high school, as a res- after that discipleship group, you'd have said, No way ever in God's green earth would that happen. No way. But God, by his grace, through his power, in the context of an intentional discipling process that we were going through, God did his work and made a difference. In Bill and Regina... All those couples, Bing, the mom, Lee, all those guys that were in that group, and who knows how many other thousands and thousands of people have been impacted out of that group. I could go on and on even out of that group, but thousands of people. When we had Regina's funeral, after Carol died, 
Regina Carroll had discipled her, so she started a Titus II mentoring, women's mentoring ministry. And at her funeral, they had all the women that she had discipled personally stand up. Over a hundred women stood up. So what I'm here to say to you is this. If you invest in discipling relationships, connecting kids to God, over time, through a process where their hearts are transformed and changed, the result of that is dynamic and life-changing and kingdom-building and evangelism-producing in ways that can't be done any other way. Not because Barry St. Clair said, but because Jesus said, go and... And for three years he... What did he do? Well, if he said, go and make disciples, he had, he had 12 guys, and what did he do with those 12 guys? He discipled them. And then for three years, he discipled them. And at the end, he said, go and make disciples. So why is that so hard for us to get? I look at youth ministry, and, and all those things I explained to you about why youth ministry is so shallow and superficial in our country really goes back to the fact that at the next level up, parents are not equipped and youth leaders are not equipped to disciple kids. Why? Because nobody's ever discipled them. And then why those people are not discipling? Because the next level up of elders, deacons, or whoever in your church, they're not discipling anybody, so they can't disciple them. These people don't get discipled because these people aren't discipled. And then there's you, if you're a pastor, a leader, a bishop in your church. Who are you discipling? And so the challenge comes down to this. You and I, you in your church, you and I are responsible not to do all this stuff, but to focus on doing ministry the way Jesus did ministry, and that was that he invested in 12 guys for three years. And then he simply said to us, see what I did there? Go and make disciples. And you and I are here because of that. But the church is much weaker because we've lost sight of that. And so my challenge for us today is this. To say how will you intentionally max out your influence right where you are. Not in some big way, but in a simple way. Of taking three men, five men, three women, five women, five young people. And saying I'm going to invest in those people. Because I want to do ministry the way Jesus did ministry. And I want them, as well as myself, to abide with Christ. And I want them to be fruit-bearing followers of Jesus that impact the world. May that be so. May the, the mission and vision statement of the Anglican Church become reality. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.